Welcome to this overview of civil liberties as we look at chapter 14 in the online PDF text as well as chapter 15 in the hard copy text. Thanks for joining me. Let's launch right into this in terms of civil liberties. Now we've seen lots of images, pictures, videos of, of what has happened over the years uh, as well as recently uh, in terms of civil liber liberties and, uh, and actions. And so we're going to delve into um, these in the next two chapters, looking at civil liberties and civil rights. We're going to first start off by talking about uh, the differences, and then uh, we'll look at um, a lot of court cases that have to do with um, a number of these uh, civil liberties that we see outlined here, and we'll look at them as well in the next chapter uh, related to civil rights and civil rights uh, freedoms and, and rights and responsibilities that we have there. Uh, so let's look at civil liberties uh, and civil rights in terms of a distinction here. So civil liberties, as it says, constitutional protections of all persons against government restrictions of freedom of conscience, religion, and expression. So think of it this way as um, if there is a freedom uh, that is outlined in the Constitution, uh, it is something that you have the right to do or not do, as the case may be. Uh, that is a civil liberty. So think of it in terms of your actions uh, that are related to this. Civil rights uh, that we'll talk about in the next chapter are constitutional rights uh, of all people. Uh, do, to due process and the equal protection of the law. And this is under the 14th Amendment, uh, such as the right not to be discriminated against um, in a number of ways. And we've seen that with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, the crucial um, civil rights bill that really had teeth. Many civil rights bills passed uh, since Reconstruction, but this is the one that really had teeth to weigh it down in terms of... Um, in terms of enforcement power and uh, ability for uh, the government to really take action based upon it. So I like to break these down uh, based on uh, looking at civil liberties and civil rights based on a protected class of people, which is what we see in civil rights. Uh, groups of people that are protected uh, based on race, based on color, religion, sex. Uh, we saw in the uh, Supreme Court case um, this past term of sexual orientation uh, covered under the Civil Rights Act, uh, as well as ethnicity, national origin, and geography, where civil liberties are more the actions of individuals. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly and petition, uh, the right to bear arms, the right to be free from search and seizure, um, and the right uh, to be free from self-incrimination or double jeopardy, as we've seen outlined in the Fifth Amendment. So really, uh, so a, a really great way to distinguish between the two is looking at that as civil rights are really uh, protecting a class of people uh, in terms of uh, of what we see here based on uh, characteristics. And civil liberties are more the actions uh, that we see of individuals uh, in terms of that. And we're going to focus in this chapter on the actions of individuals. We'll focus on the protected classes of people uh, under civil rights and civil rights protections, uh, such as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, and the impact that it had on many cases uh, in the next chapter, uh, looking at in chapter 15 or chapter 16 in the hard copy. Uh, so in looking at this, uh, let's think back for a moment to the major argument that Federalists and Anti-Federalists had. Uh, they came up with a compromise. If you recall, Madison and the founding, uh, uh, the founders framers uh, were really looking at um, the idea of the enumerated powers in the Constitution really limiting the power of the national government. Uh, but the Anti-Federalists didn't see that as, as being a real limitation of government. They really saw it as a way to usurp power from the states and to really kind of seize it, take it, and run with it. And um, so that's what led them to ask for the compromise, right, a Bill of Rights. Madison was not on board with that, uh, really, until uh, and until you saw people like Patrick Henry calling for a constitutional convention uh, to go in and fix this, uh, is really where Madison finally came on board and said, okay, whoa, 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 we know what happened the last time we had a convention. We ended up throwing everything out and starting over. We threw out the Articles of Confederation. We ended up starting over, so let's not go there. Let's go with this Bill of Rights. Uh, we promise you, if you can help us ratify uh, the Constitution, we immediately will proceed with uh, with a Bill of Rights. And so 10 of those 12 amendments uh, to the Bill of Rights uh, became a part of the Constitution as part of that compromise, as part of that procedure. Now, some things that were incorporated into the Constitution uh, were things like habeas corpus. Uh, you need to know what you're being charged with. You need to be um, able to be uh, going before a judge to know what you're being accused of. Uh, many people in Britain were basically thrown into jail and never heard from again. 
uh, and, and didn't even know what they were being charged with. That's right of habeas corpus. Uh, that was suspended during the Civil War. Lincoln couldn't charge uh, Confederate troops fast enough, uh, suspended writ of habeas corpus. We saw this uh, suspended again in, during 9-11 uh, with the, uh, the Guantanamo Bay uh, prison for enemy combatants. Uh, and uh, and terrorists uh, after 9/11, and that was critical here too in terms of suspending in terms of suspending the writ of habeas corpus, the idea of knowing uh, what I'm being charged with. Now, also, bills of attainder. I mentioned they threw people in prison. Many of them never even got a trial uh, and, and were thrown in prison, didn't even know what they were being charged with, and uh, certainly didn't have their day in court. Under bills of attainder, uh, uh, you, can't, uh, you, you can't do that. You can't punish people and just throw them in jail uh, without them having their, their rights, their right to, um, uh, to be heard and the right to be... Uh, heard before the court. And then likewise, uh, you can't have ex post facto laws. Uh, so the idea here of, uh, this is uh, the idea of creating a law after the fact, after something's already been done and action's been taken, and then all of a sudden you you create a law that says, hey, everybody who wore, wore green yesterday is going to be arrested. Uh, that's kind of how ridiculous ex post facto laws are, uh, really uh, going after people that, that weren't even aware it was against the law to do such a thing, uh, but now all of a sudden it is, and uh, you were guilty, you know, that kind of thing. So major concerns uh, the Anti-Federalists had, these were incorporated into the Constitution themselves, uh, but it really was the Bill of Rights uh, that led us to protect these individual rights um, and to protect them from this national government that they that the Anti-Federalists saw as, as a really overarching, uh, really scary type of power and the role that they could play there. That was really uh, going to be a problem and they were really concerned with that. So a uh, Bill of Rights uh, was needed and in order to uh, in order to to um, get those individual rights enshrined in the Constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights would be needed in order to pass those ten of of what was originally twelve proposed amendments. Ten of them would be passed. Eleven to this day have been have been approved. Now, uh, specific liberties that are in the Bill of Rights, and we can go. Uh, you can pause this and go into detail here. We're not going to go into all of these, uh, but the ideas that we see here are things like the Establishment Clause um, and the Free Exercise Clause. These are liberties that are outlined in the Bill of Rights uh, that people have in terms of um, the the government not establishing a, a preference for one religion over another. That's the Establishment Clause to protect those individuals uh, that want to want to um, be a part of a religion but don't want government uh, to basically uh, influence them in any way. Also, free exercise. I should be able to exercise my religion uh, in a way uh, that allows me to do so, and, and as long as I'm not infringing on the rights of others, uh, I should be able to do that. And, uh, and so if that means that I pray three times a day in particular places on my own time, then I have the right to do that. And, and things like this are specific liberties that are spelled out here. I mentioned the double jeopardy one uh, in the Fifth Amendment. I can't be charged for a crime twice uh, if I've already been found innocent of that crime. Uh, and then we have uh, the right to a jury trial, an impartial trial, a speedy trial. Um, uh, right to counsel uh, is under um, uh, the Fifth Amendment. And then um, these types of things are the liberties that we have here. These are the liberties that are spelled out in the Bill of Rights as being freedoms uh, that are enshrined in our Constitution. Now, oddly enough, we'll talk about this later, but oddly enough, these were protections that people had against um, the national government. Uh, they were protected from the national government in doing this. They didn't, this didn't mean that the states uh, couldn't do their own thing. Now, many states, like Virginia, for instance, had its own Bill of Rights. Uh, the, the national, the U.S. Bill of Rights actually came about from um, a lot of the, uh, the copycat uh, from the Virginia Bill of Rights, uh, where a lot of the U.S. Bill of Rights was actually modeled after. So important to note that there in terms of, of the freedoms that were outlined for people, for individuals uh, to have. And it's important to note uh, that these are things the federal government couldn't do. It was the national government. But again, it didn't restrict the states uh, from being able to do that. And that's where we get into that idea of selective incorporation, um, applying the Bill of Rights to states. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but the idea is uh, this was really keeping the national government uh, from taking the power away from individuals and, uh, and those individual freedoms, uh, liberties that they had as individuals under... Um, the Bill of Rights. Now, some historical context. Um, you may remember in U.S. history uh, what allowed the federal government to impose more control over the states, okay? Um, this is the idea that states wouldn't be able to exercise powers independently as they used to when states could really treat people differently. Um, 
and the uh, the idea here was uh, what came out of the Civil War. Uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction, what we call the Reconstruction Amendments, is essentially what led to the ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. You may remember the 13th abolished slavery. Uh, the 14th, uh, which is what we'll talk about here, which was the idea of equal protection, due process, the citizenship clause. Um, and then we had the 15th Amendment, uh, which is addressing, uh, giving essentially black men the right to vote. Uh, women still at this point didn't have the right to vote. But this was giving black men the right to vote. Now, uh, we know that just because they got the right to vote under the 15th Amendment didn't mean it was going to be easy. And we saw a lot of Jim Crow laws, black codes, uh, a lot of um, uh, things that would keep them from being able to exercise those rights. And we'll talk more about those later. Uh, but the idea of the 14th Amendment here is really what we want to focus on uh, because it is uh, really important to look at, uh, take a closer look at the clauses that are in there um, because those clauses are really where a lot of uh, of due process and, and civil liberties and civil rights come from today as a result of this historical context. Without the Civil War, without uh, these Reconstruction Amendments, you don't have a lot of these applications to the states uh, that you had before. And uh, why did did the, the um, uh, in the Reconstruction Amendments, uh, why did uh, Lincoln and others look at this from a perspective of, of trying to um, craft it in a way that would give the national government more power here? It was because they were trying to prevent um, the, the South, if they're going to join the Union, they're going to have to agree to these terms. Uh, and these terms meant uh, that, that uh, the national government was going to have to keep an eye on them and going to have to make sure that they, they followed the letter of the law, that slavery was illegal under the 13th Amendment, uh, that equal protection was equal uh, and that due process was followed, and that citizens of the United States declared as citizens under the 14th Amendment would now be citizens. And that's really important context here, because uh, prior to this, uh, we had the case of Barham v. Baltimore, which basically said uh, that uh, the, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to states, uh, because the founders and framers designed it to apply to the national government and to protect citizens from the national government, not from the states. The Civil War changed all of that, uh, because the 14th Amendment here really addressed uh, the issues of, of needing a national government uh, to step in in some of these cases to prevent um, uh, state governments from, from basically usurping the rights of the people, the individual rights. So we take a look at a couple of these, uh, the clauses here. Um, I might just mention the citizenship clause is probably the easiest one because it really defined the idea of national citizenship, uh, the idea of, of someone who is um, who was born here, uh, really trying to provide and grant citizenship to all of the, the former slaves that are now free people uh, to tell them that you're not just free, but you're also citizens of the United States. You were born here, you were born a part of the country, and you are a part of the country. So that citizenship clause is really critical here because it, it, it basically says you now are, not, are just free, but you also have the same rights in, as citizens uh, that were already citizens under the law. And uh, you have the same rights and privileges as those individuals. Uh, you are no different. You're not a class beneath them. You are um, uh, you are of that same standard. Uh, so that's essentially the citizenship clause, establishing that that national framework uh, for providing citizenship to all of the former slaves and their and their descendants. Uh, and uh, so we get into the other two clauses here. We're looking at due process and this idea of equal protection. So let's take a closer look at due process first. So we see a we see due process in a couple of places. Uh, we see it in the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the idea of no, uh, no person shall be uh, deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Uh, this is the idea of following the process, okay? Uh, and we'll look at this um, as a procedural due process, uh, the idea of following the procedures that are in the law. Um, do you, uh, were you uh, told what you were being accused of, right, of habeas corpus, right? Uh, did you, were you granted the, the right to remain silent, uh, the, the idea of uh, the Miranda case? Were you um, given the right to a lawyer? the Gideon case uh, and and do you have these uh, do you have these rights were these procedures followed in terms of of giving you uh, and making sure you're aware of the rights that you have and uh, and, and access to a speedy trial by a jury of your peers um, in a in a manner that is appropriate of the time and manner and place um, all of these are are very uh, procedural in due process and then we have substantive due process which is the idea of the su is the substance of the law fair is it equal is it um, 
is it granting that to everyone across the board in terms of substantively uh, you have the same rights and privileges under the process of the law as everyone else? So uh, Fifth Amendment is very important here because it's asking um, uh, to make sure that that due process is followed. Uh, this includes things like the right to remain silent. We see that under the Fifth Amendment. You hear people say, I plead the Fifth. That's what they're talking about, the idea of the right to remain silent. Also, the right to not be charged twice. A double jeopardy comes out of the Fifth Amendment, uh, which is really important here in terms of that role. And then we see 14th Amendment, uh, the due process, uh, come out of this in terms of um, making sure that uh, people have those, those uh, not just trial by jury, but the trial by a jury of your peers. To make sure, again, like I was saying, it's substantively and procedurally following the law of due process in terms of what we see here. So um, this changed the game. Uh, 14th Amendment really changed the game because now all of a sudden we have procedural and, and uh, substantive due process under the 14th Amendment. And now what we're saying is that equal protection, uh, that due process that we're looking at under the 14th Amendment, guess what? It applies to states and states can't go against that either. So it's not just the national government now that has to abide by uh, what was in the Bill of Rights. But now it's saying, you know what? All of those amendments, um, they're going to have to uh, line up with what state laws are in place and what state laws are being enforced um, because it's not just something that's applying to the states anymore. So here we had the Bill of Rights, uh, the idea of it, the uh, the rights of citizens um, and the, the national government uh, being um, being essentially boxed in by those Bill of Rights. Uh, we have the Civil War basically changing that and saying, okay, states, we gave you a lot of freedoms. Uh, you've abused them. You've, you've hurt many people along the way. And now uh, we're coming back together as a nation, but you're going to have to agree to these terms. And that includes um, that the national government and the state government are going to have to abide by the Bill of Rights. They're going to have to abide by these laws. And um, and you are going to have to uh, address this. Now, what happened was um, this, uh, this was on the books. This was the 14th Amendment. This applied to the courts. But many courts uh, were still ruling as if Barron v. Baltimore, this idea of uh, the Bill of Rights doesn't apply to states, uh, was really uh, the law of the land, was the precedent, if you will, uh, in terms of taking shape here. So uh, from that period of ratification, in 1868 until 1925, we see a, a very large gap uh, between uh, the, um, the, the role of, of what states were supposed to be incorporating, were supposed to be doing in terms of making sure that they followed the letter of the law for their individual citizens and granting them those liberties, and what actually uh, the national government would start to pass down and say, you know what, um, the states can't do that. The states can't uh, make their own laws around freedom of speech. They're violating the First Amendment, and that goes against uh, this idea of the 14th Amendment and what was laid out here. So this is the idea of selective incorporation. And um, I like to tell students um, that the best way to remember this is to think of it in terms of cases and in terms of amendments. Um, uh, the idea here is you're applying the Bill of Rights to the states on a case-by-case amendment by amendment basis. And um, this is the idea of selective incorporation. I'll come back to that last slide, but I just wanna show this because it's important to define this first. Uh, selective incorporation is this idea of applying the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, applying the Bill of Rights to the states on a case by case, amendment by amendment basis. If you look through here, and we're gonna look at that in just a second, uh, but what you see is each part of the amendments of the Bill of Rights were incorporated selectively. They were incorporated case by case, amendment by amendment, um, basically working through, and, and let's just take the First Amendment, looking at this here in terms of the First Amendment. The freedom of speech was incorporated in 1925. This is what started it all. It was Gitlow v. New York, and the courts, the Supreme Court ruled uh, that Gitlow was the case that incorporated free speech. New York did not have the right uh, to uh, pass laws in the state of New York that uh, fringe, infringed on the rights of freedom of speech of, of New Yorkers, of citizens uh, in New York. So uh, this incorporated it. It basically applied the Bill of Rights to New York and all of the states to say uh, that you can't infringe on freedom of speech. In 1931, they would look at freedom of the press in the case of Near v. Minnesota and do the same thing. They would say freedom of the press, 
mm, you can't, uh, Minnesota, you can't pass laws against freedom of the press that infringes on freedom of the press. That's covered under the First Amendment, and it is a right every citizen has under the Bill of Rights uh, in any state in the Union, okay? And they would continue to do this in cases that we see here. Uh, we would see everything uh, up uh, to and including uh, the latest ones, which were the Second Amendment and the Eighth Amendment. Uh, we did a, a moot court case on the Eighth Amendment, the Timms v. Indiana, which is excessive bail or fines. Um, and then the uh, McDonald v. Chicago case that came out, and I'll talk a little bit more later about uh, both of those, uh, the right to bear arms, uh, came about as a result of D.C. v. Heller, which was uh, an earlier case. Um, but uh, Chicago came in and basically uh, the uh, court said, uh, just like we said in D.C. v. Heller, you have the right to bear arms. Uh, not only can D.C. not pass a law uh, that, that violates the Second Amendment, but Chicago or Illinois can't also um, uh, pass a law that infringes on the Second Amendment either. So they've essentially gone through and incorporated uh, the rights that citizens have under the Bill of Rights in order to apply it uh, case by case, state by state, to all of these institutions uh, and to make sure that, uh, that the Bill of Rights are applying to all of the citizens in all of the states, regardless of where you are. So this is coming about as a result of this idea of the due process clause under the 14th Amendment. The idea here uh, that procedures have to be followed and what that means under due process is uh, that it applies to everybody, not just one state, not just the national government, but everybody uh, across the board. So national courts, state courts, federal courts, circuit courts, whatever the case may be, district courts, um, they all have to um, abide by the due process clause. And this is the precedent that is set here in the selective incorporation of the Bill of Rights or the nationalization of the Bill of Rights in terms of what we see there. So um, again, it started in 1925, uh, applying it to the states and piece by piece, as we, uh, we last saw in, in 2019, we've incorporated all of these cases as we've gone along. And it continues uh, in terms of uh, using the precedent of those cases to say to um, uh, legislators in states, you, you, can't, you can't do that. You can't pass a law that goes against the Constitution. And remember, the Bill of Rights is a part of the Constitution, just like it was there on the first day it was, the Constitution was ratified. Uh, so all of that applies. Um, in, in what we see here is uh, that selective incorporation uh, being applied again and again. Now, uh, I mentioned the D.C. v. Heller case and McDonald v. Chicago. Uh, they were two years apart, uh, but essentially, um, if the uh, Supreme Court wanted to drive a nail in the coffin of any legislation out there uh, uh, infringing on the Second Amendment, this was a great way to do it. Uh, they looked at the D.C. law and said, uh, you can't uh, pass a law in D.C. that violates the Constitution. And states said, well, yeah, but we can. We're not D.C., right? Uh, Congress has juris special jurisdiction over D.C., but not over us. And so this is where the Chicago law came from. Uh, and then two years later, they took up the case of McDonald v. Chicago and said the same thing. Said, hey, you can't do it either. Uh, not only can D.C. not do it, but you can't do it either. That is uh, unacceptable. And um, the idea there is that you have... Um, you have no ability to write a law that infringes on the Second Amendment. Uh, this is the idea of what we call statutory construction. They try and construct a statute or a state law or a, a local law that goes around the rights uh, that are available there. Uh, so uh, we're not going to take it away. We're going to uh, craft a law around it that makes it more difficult. We've seen this with um, abortion uh, in that states have uh, crafted laws to go around it, a parental notification, um, uh, for minors, um, the idea of, uh, of of waiting periods, of of notifying uh, the father in some cases, uh, we've seen you know lots of laws uh, that kind of. Uh, don't touch the heart of Roe v. Wade, but try and craft legislation that go around it to make it more difficult to get an abortion. Uh, Texas did this in um, cutting back and, and creating laws uh, that cut into um, many abortion clinics and, and said uh, you have to be within, what is 100 miles of a hospital or something like that. And um, and that was in the Texas v. Reproductive Services case uh, that the, the Supreme Court found to be unconstitutional. Uh, now, I think this court today uh, would probably rule differently on that case with a 6-3 conservative majority. I think there'd be a different ruling on that today uh, if that case were to come before the court. But this is the idea of, of those rights being incorporated. And, and in McDonald v. Chicago, uh, we definitely saw that in terms of uh, uh, that being addressed. Now, Tim's v. Indiana was the last case to be incorporated in terms of the Eighth Amendment. Um, and this is the one I mentioned, the moot court we did. Uh, this was the idea of uh, if, 
if there's a drug bust, um, can you seize uh, all of the assets of the uh, person who's being accused, uh, the, the, the guilty party? Uh, if they're found guilty, can you um, uh, find them in a way that takes away all of their assets? Uh, or is this excessive, uh, an excessive fine? And what the Supreme Court ruled was that it was. It was an excessive fine, and it violated the Eighth Amendment uh, of excessive bail or fines. Uh, and so this was the last right uh, that we have seen incorporated to date um, in, the, uh, in the Bill of Rights. And um, the others that are left, uh, there aren't many, uh, the others that are left, uh, the Third Amendment, we don't quarter soldiers in homes, so that's really not an issue uh, anymore. And then uh, the right to jury trial in civil cases, and that hasn't come up as an issue that needs to be incorporated. Most states have kind of abided by that already, so that's not really not really an issue for them uh, thus far. So let's go back to the First Amendment and take a look at uh, some of these civil liberties uh, that we have here in addressing uh, the uh, the five freedoms of the First Amendment. Um, uh, working with the National Constitution Center as I have, we've done a lot with these. There's some really great explainers and videos out there on specific uh, freedoms. Um, so if you do a Google search on National Constitution Center, you can see some of these that come up uh, on freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech, petition, religion and assembly. Um, and and it, it's pretty fascinating to see in the First Amendment how much they were able to get into one amendment. Uh, this idea of not establishing a, 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 a preference for one religion or another, um, not prohibiting the free exercise of those religions, not being able to um, infringe on freedom of speech or press, and then allowing people to assemble peaceably uh, in those environments, and also petitioning your government uh, to be able to do that in a peaceful way, uh, and to be able to do that in a way that that is effective and um, and and allows people to speak when make their voices heard. Again, individual rights anti-federalists uh, were definitely behind in terms of really driving home the message of individual civil liberties uh, of individuals, regardless of what state they're in. So if we look at religion, uh, this has two parts. Uh, we mentioned uh, uh, the idea of the establishment clause here, uh, the idea of this wall of separation we've heard about time and again, uh, the idea of, of government not showing a preference for one religion over another. Uh, this is the idea of the Establishment Clause, of, of not um, showing a preference is really the idea here. Government doesn't uh, doesn't have a, a state church, doesn't have a state religion. Um, we are not a theocracy. Um, and the idea here is um, because we honor freedom of religion, we allow people to then exercise that religion in ways uh, that, that, again, abide with the law, uh, but are able to do so in a way uh, that, that they can feel um, like they are honoring their, their religious beliefs. Uh, and so that's the exercise portion, the idea of being able to exercise those rights, those freedoms. Uh, but the government taking a step back and getting out of it is really the establishment clause. So if they're asking you about religion, uh, they are looking for one of these two specific clauses. So make sure you identify it by name in terms of it's either establishment or free exercise in terms of uh, the freedom of religion. So keep in mind here that liberal justices, uh, kind of going back to what we talked about in the judicial branch uh, and the judiciary, liberal justices would want to enforce a more strict separation standard uh, in terms of that establishment clause. Uh, they would want to see a line or a wall of separation between the two, uh, where conservative justices would say, well, as long as we're not establishing one religion, uh, one theocracy within government, we're okay, uh, and and let religion kind of do what it, what it needs to in that capacity. And that is kind of uh, where conservatives and liberals have come down on these cases, for the most part. Um, when we look at Engel v. Vitale, uh, what we see here is, here is a case in which uh, the New York State Board is basically um, uh, mandating that schools, uh, every classroom with, with uh, students, is going to recite a prayer, a voluntary prayer, uh, at the start of each school day. Uh, and, and the idea here was um, you didn't have to recite it if you didn't want to, but if you wanted to, you could. Uh, very voluntary in nature, but everybody at least had to be offered the opportunity, okay? Uh, and, um, and so the idea here is, well, is it okay? Because it's non-denominational. It doesn't really uh, address a particular religion or another. Uh, but the Supreme Court took up the case in Engel v. Vitale and basically came back and said, in a six-to-one ruling uh, uh, for Engel, uh, said, 
that um, you can't do this. This violates the Establishment Clause without question. Uh, this uh, essentially goes against that wall of separation that we're talking about here. So you really can't do this uh, with without um, without violating or showing preference for one religion over another. Now we get to Wisconsin v. Yoder, uh, and this is where the Amish community basically want their um, kids to um, work on the farm, and they have children, uh, they need their help uh, on the farm in order to get things done. And so um, the idea here was uh, there were parents that refused to send their kids uh, to school after eighth grade because they said uh, they only really need education up to that point, and now we need their we need their hands on the farm. Um, and so uh, Wisconsin law uh, basically was was saying, hey, you got to be in school uh, until you're 16. Uh, you don't have an option. Um, and so uh, this case went to the Supreme Court, and uh, the question was, can a community uh, keep their children from mandatory schooling based on religion? Uh, can the Amish community uh, take their kids out um, uh, at eighth, after eighth grade and uh, in order to help with the family? Because it is basically uh, their religious beliefs uh, are very community-oriented, and, and that was a part of their beliefs. And the Supreme Court came back unanimously and said, yes, uh, the, the Amish community uh, can do this under their religions, uh, because they basically said that uh, the religious aspect here outweighed the state aspect. Um, what the state law was trying to do was a very noble one, uh, but it didn't um, supersede or usurp the rights of the the um, uh, the religion uh, of the Amish community. And so uh, this violated what we call the free exercise of their religion. Um, and so if they wanted to exercise that by taking their kids out of school after eighth grade, they had, under their religious beliefs, uh, they had the right to do that because that would otherwise be a violation a free exercise. So now we've seen a case, uh, Engel v. Vitale, uh, that was the Establishment Clause. It is a case you need to know. And uh, Wisconsin v. Yoder, a uh, case of Free Exercise Clause. So those are two really great examples of the Free Exercise and Establishment Clauses. So what did the court say here? This is what's important. Uh, think about this in terms of what the court has been has struck down over the years uh, since we saw Eng the, uh, the court ruling in Engel v. Vitale. Uh, school prayer has been struck down. That doesn't mean that you can't pray individually uh, on your own time, uh, you know, at lunch, before school, after school, between classes, before a test or whatever. Uh, but what it does mean uh, is that uh, the court said uh, that schools can't get involved in that. That can't be uh, school involvement there. Uh, creationism in public schools also struck down. Uh, again, showing a preference, uh, violating the Establishment Clause, showing a preference for one religion over another. Um, ministers at graduation also struck down. Uh, ministers uh, giving a prayer at graduation, also something uh, violating the constitutional establishment clause in what we see here. And then organized prayer at football games, again, uh, violating uh, the uh, the idea of of uh, uh, this uh, this idea of, of individual prayer uh, at or, or organized prayer, excuse me, uh, at football games. Um, you can pray however you want to on your own time uh, and at any time. Um, it, it, when uh, when it doesn't disrupt uh, the the ex educational experience of others, but when it comes to that, um, that is the um, that is the only case, and it can't be organized uh, by by those that are that are paid by the state. Uh, it can't be organized uh, by or or mandated by by um, administrators and that sort of thing. But the idea there is um, that they have basically drawn this line of separation and said um, you're violating free exercise, you're violating establishment if you're doing this. So stay out of it, right? Uh, so we have this continuum of free speech where we see you know government can restrict your speech uh, totally. Uh, and or never right and then somewhere in between and that's where usually where we see um, the um, uh, that's where we see the courts fall now you can pause here and identify where you would be on that free speech continuum but what we've seen is the courts are going to step in on particular aspects of speech um, and we're going to uh, take a look at a couple cases in which uh, they address this uh, in terms of uh, what's allowed and what isn't okay and and where the courts have ruled on this so um, Remember, uh, the idea here is uh, when it comes to blanket language, um, the courts have always recognized exceptions uh, to this uh, this language in the First Amendment. Okay, um, your beliefs are protected. Uh, you can believe what you want to. Uh, the the action is what is uh, going to be restricted. Um, 
and then the speech uh, that is given there, uh, if it incites action uh, that is that is uh, in, incites violence and whatnot, uh, then uh, then that's probably not free speech, uh, and the courts have ruled such uh, that 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 is a problem. And we see things uh, like libel, uh, fighting words, uh, incitement of riots, uh, obscenity, commercial speech. Uh, these things are not free. Uh, and and uh, don't fall under free speech. Uh, they aren't protected under the First Amendment in those cases. Uh, fighting words. We we've heard this um, in terms of uh, what we see here. Uh, the uh, a lot of the hate speech laws have been overturned, but hate crime laws upheld. Right. And so uh, the idea is uh, hate crime law. You're going to um, uh, hold a a higher uh, punishment for someone who has committed a crime uh, against someone because of their um, association with a particular group, uh, race, ethnicity, um, uh, gender, sexual orientation, whatever the case may be. Um, so um, in this case, you had um, a leader in the KKK making a speech at a rally uh, and being convicted of a crime in Ohio. And, uh, and the idea here was uh, the speech was targeting uh, the government and people of color. They said they had the right to free speech uh, under the law, uh, but um, uh, the idea is uh, the comments didn't incite imminent violence, and therefore it was free speech and was allowable um, under under that. Um, but that is the only time uh, in which, if it is inciting violence, inciting action, people to take action against others, um, then that would no longer be free speech. It would no longer be free under that that type of speech. Uh, so uh, it is protected up to an uh, up to the point at which it would incite violence, uh, imminent violence, uh, I think was the term they used. And that um, would be a problem. That would be a violation uh, and, and would no longer be protected speech in terms of what we see there. So go back for a second to what we talked about in uh, the bureaucracy, the idea of the Federal Communications uh, Commission, the FCC, um, uh, fining a TV station, uh, showing a Super Bowl commercial uh, in which um, either a, a um, a swear word was used or indecent material was shown. Um, this is the idea of that's not protected speech. Um, and, and so um, the, uh, the court has ruled that that's not protected under the law. That's not what we call by freedom of press or freedom of speech. Um, that is, uh, it, it doesn't hold any type of, of freedom protections under the First Amendment. Now, uh, we get to Schenck v. U.S., which is a case 1919, where um, uh, Schenck is passing out uh, pamphlets against the war, uh, telling people to um, dodge the draft and, and burn your card, um, and basically is arrested. Now, uh, it's important to note at this point in time that the... Um, uh, the Supreme Court, it, the the country is at war. The country is in war, and uh, the question is, did he have, uh, as he claimed, freedom of speech to be able to say those things? Um, now, uh, we, the country has changed since, uh, in terms of uh, what's allowable, and the medium has also changed. They're not passing out pamphlets anymore. They're using the the internet. Uh, but uh, the Supreme Court ruled by a unanimous decision. Um, that he did not uh, have the right uh, to, to uh, make these statements, uh, burn your draft card, uh, because during wartime, uh, it is different than in times of peace. And in wartime, you don't have the right to just say anything you want. Um, and um, and that is, uh, is, is different in terms of what we see today, where we see a much longer leash in terms of giving people, even during wartime, uh, the right to be able to say lots of things. Uh, this was a, a much... Uh, clamp down version of freedom of speech um, like we have not seen uh, since uh, in, in this court to have a unanimous opinion um, in terms of wartime and really clamping down on that freedom of speech. So um, this is that balance of freedoms and, and government that we talk about and the importance uh, after 9-11. Uh, what changed? Well, we had the Patriot Act, um, something that probably wouldn't have been passed um, in Congress, I wouldn't have even seen the light of day in Congress before 9/11. Uh, but but all of a sudden we uh, we we balance this idea of of liberty versus security, and all of a sudden people are really much more interested in security than liberty. Uh, and so we saw a lot of rights given away under the Patriot Act. Now some of those have expired since then, uh, but the idea there is it is a constant back and forth uh, in terms of that liberty versus security. Uh, aspect. Uh, we get to the case of Tinker v. Des Moines, uh, and this is where uh, the um, Mary Beth Tinker and her brother uh, basically um, wore armbands to oppose the Vietnam War. Uh, 
it was uh, it was not accompanied by a speech or anything. It was just wearing the armband, and um, and she and her brother were suspended for wearing it to school. It didn't disrupt the educational experience. Uh, they didn't get up and make a speech in class or anything. Uh, they just literally were using it as symbolic protest, and they said it was uh, part of their freedom of speech. And the Supreme Court uh, agreed with them in a 7-2 decision and said, this is pure speech. It doesn't uh, go against the educational experience uh, that students are having. And as long as it isn't a disruption, that is what's key. It didn't disrupt the educational experience. It didn't disrupt the school environment. And so therefore, it was protected. It was allowable speech under the First Amendment. Uh, because it was symbolic. Now, had they got up and given a speech or, or led a rally or done something different, m maybe the outcome would have been different. Uh, but in this case, all they were doing was wearing the armband. Wearing something uh, was, was part of their freedom of speech. It didn't disrupt the, uh, the school uh, day, and so the Supreme Court agreed that that they were within their um, within their rights to be able to do that. Uh, we get to New York Times v. U.S. Uh, this is a case in which we're looking at uh, freedom of the press. Uh, the uh, Nixon administration is trying to prevent newspapers uh, from publishing materials uh, that were classified. Uh, and were were uh, uh, the idea here was um, they they were. Uh, leaked to the press and and somehow they got a hold of them and and so the idea here was uh, the president wanted to issue what's called prior restraint the idea of basically censoring the media before they had a chance to publish it uh, and um, and uh, the, uh, the as you can imagine the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, basically taking this to court saying you can't do this you can't uh, violate our freedom of the press uh, in order to do this. And the Supreme Court came back and, and said, uh, in a per curiam opinion, uh, not really any, any writing here, um, basically said, uh, you can't do that, Mr. President. Uh, you can't use prior restraint. Uh, now, uh, we will see in, in a Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer case, um, where the uh, Supreme Court stepped in and said, in cases of school journalism, uh, school newspapers, they can be censored by administrators because it is a government entity that is owned by the, the, the government. Um, so school newspapers can be censored. Now, we have no prior review in, in uh, Montgomery County, uh, so uh, we are not censored in, in that aspect. Uh, student uh, advisor, or excuse me, student uh, leaders on on media, uh, newspapers, and and um, and uh, that sort of uh, uh, that sort of thing uh, have freedom to do that with their advisor's approval and that kind of thing. Uh, but but the principal doesn't look at it and approve everything uh, as each, each page goes to press. Uh, that isn't something we have in Maryland. And and in this case, um, the Supreme Court said uh, that freedom of the press is freedom of the press, and that applies. And the president can't issue uh, a censor on what they. They're, they're going to publish just because uh, it used to be classified information or something like that. Um, so now let's shift gears uh, for a second and talk about the Fifth Amendment, this idea of eminent domain. Uh, this is the idea of taking uh, uh, property that is owned by, by citizens, owned by individuals, and using it for some type of common good, some type of public use, uh, giving you fair market value for it, uh, being, but being able to take the property because it's going to be used by something. Um, and a great example of this uh, is um, whenever they're building a highway, the intercounty connector that was built through Montgomery County, um, uh, Highway 200, was basically a lot of homes uh, that were in there for decades. Uh, homes uh, that were being taken under eminent domain in order to make way for this highway. Uh, that is an example of eminent domain. Um, and the as long as they're giving you fair market value for your property, uh, the government does have the right to step in and take that. Uh, and so uh, that's also an example of federalism because we see national, state, and local government working on this, this intercounty connector between um, uh, uh, traffic that's coming uh, within the state of Maryland, uh, but going to places uh, elsewhere, such as Pennsylvania and Virginia, and um, and trying to you know ease the traffic flow in so doing. So eminent domain is is this example. Now there is a case in which uh, in uh, Kellovy, the city of New London, Connecticut, uh, where uh, in 2005. Um, the court said, not only can you do this um, for a public use, but public use can also include a public-private partnership, uh, which is uh, they were going to take the property uh, in a in a very uh, depressed part of town. It was uh, um, not as as revitalized as other areas, and they were going to use it for um, a combination of a city center, civic center, and um, hotels and restaurants and and apartments and and that sort of thing. And it was going to be 
a, a public-private partnership in so doing. And uh, the question was, well, do they still have the right to take it if it's going to be used for, for private use as well as public public use? And the court stepped in and said they, they do. They have the right to take it uh, for that purpose. Now, it set off a flurry of state laws uh, that that people were looking at and saying, oh, you, we're going to enshrine in our constitution the fact that that the, the government can't take um, private property uh, for private use uh, if it's not a, a specifically public use. And so there were a lot of state constitutions that were that were modified after that um, in order to incorporate that into their state constitutions. Uh, but that still is the law of the land in terms of eminent domain that we see today. Uh, let's talk, uh, going back to this idea of due process, I mentioned the, uh, the um, procedural and substantive due process in terms of equal justice under the law. And so what we see here is, are the methods of, of the due process system, when you're being accused of a crime, are they being followed? Um, do you have the right to be free from search and seizure, Fourth Amendment? Do you have the right to, a, uh, to be silent and uh, to your words not to be used against you? Uh, that's the Fifth Amendment. Uh, the, the right to a jury trial uh, in a, a civil or a criminal case uh, in what we see here. The right to a trial by a jury and a speedy trial. Uh, the right to um, a trial by a jury of your peers and making sure that is followed under the letter of the law. All of these are very procedural in nature to make sure that the uh, the courts are following and giving you all of the due process rights that you have um, and everyone else has under the law. Substantive is uh, in, in terms of fairness, in terms of is the substance of the due process you've been granted, is it fair? Um, and, and is it fair in terms of how it's being applied to you? Uh, and that's where we see a lot of civil rights cases coming in in terms of people who are, are found guilty by a jury of their quote unquote peers um, and uh, sentenced um, and sentenced to severe uh, punishments uh, just because of the color of their skin uh, and um, and that is a, a violation of the substantive due process that we've seen here over the years so that is important in terms of taking a look at at the idea of substantive and procedural due process very different in nature procedural very following the procedures of the law substantive uh, the substance of the law in terms of trying to address uh, an issue of fairness in terms of what we see there. So are there reasonable searches and seizures? Well, uh, we've seen this over time. Airport searches, great example. After 9-11, we saw a lot more airport searching, a lot step more stepped up uh, searching, drug testing, uh, student searches. You really don't have a whole lot of freedom when you're walking on school property in terms of student searches. That locker may be yours and the bag inside it may be yours, but if there is um, probable cause uh, that you have uh, something in that bag, they have the right to search it. Uh, as long as there is an administrator and a witness there, uh, they can go through those materials, your locker, your bag, your purse, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, and you don't always have to consent to that. Uh, so um, sobriety checkpoints, um, you know, all of these are, are uh, there are situations in which there are reasonable uh, searches and seizures uh, that we see today that that uh, have held up in in courts in terms of uh, in terms of the law. Now, warrantless searches um, in cases of like like it says here, hot pursuit. Um, you um, don't um, you, you would have a reason to follow them because of of actions that have been taken. You're in hot pursuit as a result. Um, uh, there's an emergency or or some type of of safety issue that is at work here that that necessitates the expediency of of moving this forward. Um, but again, you in a court, you really got to be able to outline that because um, they are pretty um, pretty strict in terms of uh, throwing cases out uh, that don't that that don't comply with the law in terms of the policies and procedures that uh, bureaucrats including police officers, would have to follow in those particular cases. Uh, so that's really important here. Now, looking at Fourth Amendment in terms of search and seizure, um, uh, do you have privacy in a phone booth? Well, do we even have phone booths anymore? Um, do you have privacy in a school locker? Um, uh, no. Uh, in your own home? Yes. Uh, Fourth Amendment, uh, they have to have a warrant and and there has to, a judge has to sign off on it in terms of what they're able to look at. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, trash. Uh, no, there is no expectation of privacy. You've thrown it out. It's sitting at the curb. Someone goes through it and finds things 
um, about you and then and then holds it against you, um, that is evidence they can use. Uh, there is no expectation of privacy there. Your car, well, it depends. Uh, it depends on um, if they have the ability or have probable cause to search your car. It depends on if you've given them the opportunity to search the car. Did you get out of the car and close the door or did you leave the door open? Leaving the door open invites um, uh, the ability to be able to uh, search your car. Uh, so those are kind of the intricacies uh, that we've seen uh, on Fourth Amendment in terms of the courts, uh, in terms of addressing this. Now, um, if you're arrested, if things are in plain sight, uh, or if uh, they're under your control, uh, there's no expectation of privacy there. They they can uh, they can ask you for those items or they can search uh, those items as well. Now, uh, where does this privacy come from? Well, as we talked about before, uh, we saw this with Griswold. Uh, this this expectation of privacy, a penumbra of amendments establishing this right to privacy, uh, which gave way to Roe v. Wade, uh, the idea of a right to an abortion because of the right to privacy. And we see this extending now uh, in in this right to privacy even to sexual orientation. Uh, um, with Bowers v. Hardwick, uh, to uh, gay males engaging in consensual sex in, uh, in 1986. And the court said um, that they had no privacy as a result of, of what was going on here. Um, now, in 2003, uh, looking at this, what, uh, 17 years later, they changed their mind. Uh, this is a good example of the court reversing itself uh, and basically saying, uh, wait a minute, uh, there is a, a right to privacy if you're in your own a home or apartment or whatever and the police break in, uh, that is an invasion of your privacy. But in Bowers v. Hardwick back in 1986, uh, that was not. Uh, so you can see here where right to privacy has uh, kind of changed over time uh, with the courts and that interpretation in terms of what we see there. Now, proof is a great example uh, uh, in terms of what they call reasonable suspicion um, do you have reasonable suspicion uh, that, that someone is either committing a crime or uh, has committed a crime? Um, they have reasonable suspicion. They can stop you. They can uh, um, uh, have a reason to, uh, to search uh, and, uh, and, and don't necessarily need a warrant in order to do that. And again, uh, the situation necessitates the action, uh, but if there is a, a suspicion of something happening there, um, they do have the right to stop you, to frisk you, uh, to search individuals. Also, probable cause. Uh, you believe a crime is going to be committed or, or one has been committed, um, they can get a warrant, they can uh, arrest someone, take someone in uh, for questioning and whatnot. Uh, so uh, there are requirements of proof uh, that, um, that law enforcement does have to take in terms of uh, what we're seeing here. But the idea is um, that again, if you're in hot pursuit, if there's uh, an expediency, a, an urgency to it, uh, that may not always uh, necessarily be honored. Uh, in those particular cases. Now, in the case of Gideon v. Wainwright, uh, this is an incorporation case on the right to counsel, um, the Sixth Amendment. And um, the idea here was um, you had a right to an attorney in a capital crime, uh, but what Gideon was facing uh, wasn't a capital crime. Uh, he he uh, hadn't, uh, he hadn't uh, killed anyone um, and in, in this case, uh, it was theft and, and uh, concerns about breaking and entering and, and theft. And, and so did he have a right to a lawyer? And, and the, uh, the Florida court said, no, he didn't in that case. And they didn't appoint someone to represent him because they said only in a capital crime uh, would you need uh, to be able to um, get a right to a lawyer. And so they didn't give him one. He lost the case. He couldn't research it. Uh, he had no lawyer. Uh, he represented himself in that case because he... Uh, uh, was in formal pauperis. You remember that? Uh, he was poor. And so um, what they did was um, uh, he uh, they, they sent him to prison. They found him guilty. They sent him to prison. And while in prison, he was researching in the law, in the library, uh, researching his case, and he wrote an appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, and he said, I don't believe uh, that I my my um, my rights were given to me under the Sixth Amendment. I have the right to counsel. I don't think that was honored in this case, and I think uh, that I should have the right to counsel. Uh, and the Supreme Court came back and basically, in a unanimous decision, uh, said that yes, he did have the right to counsel. Uh, in, in all cases uh, in which you have a criminal defendant, uh, whether whether it is a felony or a misdemeanor, you have the right to counsel. You have the right to an attorney. And he was not given that right. And therefore, the outcome of the case uh, was heavily dependent on having access to a lawyer. And so what they did was they didn't let him off. Uh, they remanded the case back to the district court uh, in Florida. They gave him a lawyer and they retried the case. Now, the lawyer was able to do some research. They actually found out 
who the, the person was that actually committed the crime. Uh, they, they were able to corroborate Gideon's story about where, where he was on the night of this break-in. And uh, they were able to find him innocent in a, in a court because he had a lawyer. Uh, he was able um, uh, to be acquitted. And, um, and so this is, and it set a precedent uh, that uh, when you are accused of a crime you, in, a, in a criminal defense uh, court, um, state court or district court or federal court otherwise, uh, you have the right to an attorney. And if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you at the cost of the court. This is a right that you have in this particular case. Okay. Uh, a really important case. And that incorporated uh, the Sixth Amendment in terms of what we talk about there. So um, let's uh, go back to a couple of uh, uh, cases on prayer because we see um, we see this taking shape. Uh, Levy Weissman uh, comes in at um, uh, in 1992. Can clergy offer prayers at graduations or football games? Um, and this court said, no, uh, you cannot. Uh, so again, not a case you need to know, but definitely a good background for addressing the idea of of um, Try, trying to establish that, uh, uh, to go away from that wall of separation uh, so that the government isn't stepping in and, and looking like it's uh, endorsing one religion over another. We see the Westside Community Schools v. Mergen's case. Um, can a group uh, of students organize a, a, a religious club? Uh, and the answer was yes, they can. Um, as long as it is organized and, uh, and run by students and not by faculty or administrators, uh, they do have the right to organize uh, just like any other club would in those particular cases. So that is what we see there. Now, um, important to note, uh, liable for a second. Uh, this liable is the idea of defaming another person or writing something that is false and can be proven to be false. Um, uh, the idea of, of, of uh, libel in terms of this uh, written defamation comes from the 1963 case of New York Times v. Sullivan. Um, now, if you're a public official, uh, you cannot um, sue for libel. It's very hard to prove uh, because when you're an elected official, uh, you are basically uh, at the mercy of, 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 of the media in terms of addressing your issues. And so that is, um, uh, that is not necessarily uh, a standard that the court has, has agreed with. Uh, but the idea here is um, it has to be false. Uh, it has to be able to be proved to be false. And, um, and if you can prove that, then, um, then you have a case. And if you are, um, but again, a very high standard. And if you're an elected official, forget it. Uh, it's just, it's just almost impossible to say, well, am I, you invaded my privacy. As a private citizen, yes, um, you can prove that. Again, very high standard, uh, but it can be done. Um, we talk about the idea of obscenity. Um, uh, this was a community standard that was established. Um, that basically um, came back with what we call the slaps test. Uh, a community can consider something to be obscene. Uh, what works in New York City may not work in Peoria, Illinois. Um, and so the uh, idea of the slaps test, looking at something that is serious, literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, uh, would pass that slaps test, would pass um, this idea of being considered obscene. So uh, if it lacked this uh, slaps, uh, that would essentially uh, be labeled obscene. And again, uh, the court looked at this in Miller v. California and said, we know it when we see it, um, and this is the standard that was, that was set here. Every community, uh, every state had the right to be able to uh, establish that on their own, and that's where we get the obscenity test uh, that we see today, that slaps test. Um, some school cases that we mentioned, I mentioned the Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer, this, the censorship of school media that we saw here. Uh, Bethel v. Frazier, just because you get up and, and uh, want to speak uh, doesn't mean you can say whatever you want to. Um, uh, again, uh, it can't be vulgar or offensive to people. Uh, just because you think it's free speech doesn't necessarily make it so. And the case of Morse v. Frederick is also a good example of this. Um, this idea of endorsing illegal drugs or illegal drug use um, is also uh, an area where your freedom ends. Um, and, uh, and the school can prohibit that type of speech. And, uh, and they did so in those cases, and the court upheld that, um, that ruling of that limitation by schools. So um, just because um, uh, 
you have free speech doesn't mean you have it on school grounds and in school events and at school um, activities. Um, the the uh, school has a lot of rights and a lot of precedent backing them up in terms of uh, limiting that speech. It's it's not quite as free as it is uh, just walking down the street or or um, at a uh, a public park uh, at an event or a rally or something at a public park or somewhere like that. Uh, the Fourth Amendment uh, looks at search and seizure. This comes from that New Jersey v. TLO case uh, that we'll talk more about when we um, when we look at the high school assessment. Uh, but uh, it is a case you need to know in the state of Maryland uh, because um, the uh, school has the right to search your locker. They have the right to search your purse, your book bag. If you are coming onto school grounds, uh, you agree um, that they have the right to search anything that you bring onto school grounds, including your person. Uh, and um, and they need to uh, have reasonable cause to be able to do it, right? Uh, they need to be um, uh, to have this in order to, to do it, but they don't need a warrant. They just needed a witness in order to make that happen. Uh, and this includes things, as I mentioned, like lockers, backpacks, book bags, um, uh, uh, duffel bags, any types of things like that. Um, teachers wouldn't be the one to do it. It'd be securities and administrators um, here in Maryland. Uh, but the idea is the same in that they do have the right to do that and they don't need a warrant to do it as long as they have um, a reasonable cause uh, or suspicion in order to in order to make that happen. Uh, the exclusionary rule came about from a case called Matt v. Ohio. Uh, sadly, one you don't need to know, but an interesting one. Uh, this basically uh, was the idea if you if you come into a home for one reason and you find something else that violates the law, can you arrest them for that? And um, and that's what happened in the case of Dole Remap. Um, and the court said no. Uh, if it wasn't on the warrant, and that's why warrants are written pretty broadly today, even though judges try and write them much more um, focused. Uh, cops try and write them much more broadly because uh, they want to be able uh, to fall back on whatever it is they find when they get inside. And in this case, um, it didn't stick. Uh, the, the idea was that the warrant was for something specific. Uh, what they were arresting Dolry Map for was, was not, and therefore it violated uh, the Fourth Amendment, that freedom of uh, from search and seizure. Uh, so um, this also uh, goes along the lines of drug testing. Um, are there cases in which uh, you can be drug tested and it is permissible? Absolutely. Uh, we see this with law enforcement. We see this with um, those that are um, uh, pilots uh, or, or railroad uh, engineers. Um, and, uh, and sobriety checks are good examples of this in terms of Fourth Amendment. They have withstood uh, court cases in, in, in those terms. And, um, and why? Because of public safety. Uh, really, the, uh, the, the safety of the public outweighs any other rights uh, that are there uh, in terms of uh, addressing that. Uh, Miranda v. Arizona. I know I've mentioned this one earlier uh, as we close out this, uh, this overview. Miranda v. Arizona, the idea of... Um, uh, were you were you given your rights? Were you given uh, were you told when you were arrested that you had the right uh, to remain silent uh, and that anything you say can and would be against uh, used against you in a court of law? Uh, and this is the violation of the Fifth Amendment self incrimination. Um, if I say something, um, I can self incriminate myself. I can be free from that if I just shut up and be quiet. And so that's what uh, the the police have to be informing you of those rights. And in Miranda v. Arizona, that's exactly what the court said. Miranda wasn't um, informed of the rights that he had to remain silent, to be free from self-incrimination. And so this led to what we call the Miranda rights that we see today. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed to you at the cost of the court. Um, uh, you can decide at any time to exercise these rights and not answer any questions or make any statements. Uh, do you understand each of these rights? At that point, um, anything you say can be used against you. Um, uh, regardless of whether you agree or not, anything you say at that point, they have, they have issued your rights. Anything you say at that point uh, can then be used against you in a court of law. And so um, that is why the Miranda rights are so important. Now, uh, it's important here as we close out the, to look at the review based on the, the court cases we've talked about, and I know we've talked about a lot of them, um, but uh, to keep in mind the amendments and clauses that are here in terms of addressing uh, these ideas, Engel v. Vitale, uh, looking at the Establishment Clause, Wisconsin v. Yoder, looking at the uh, Free Exercise Clause, uh, Tinker v. Des Moines with the symbolic speech is free speech, uh, Schenck v. U.S., uh, the idea of, of no, no free speech in times of war, and, uh, and you get the idea. Uh, so it's important to look at those. Why? Uh, because we have seven required SCOTUS cases from this unit. Uh, 
uh, that you're going to be responsible for knowing. And so um, this SCOTUS analysis FRQ is just knowing enough about the case to write a couple of sentences about it. Uh, and that's why it's so important to take a look at those cases, uh, to look at that from the perspective of um, uh, what the case is about and what's significant, what's the outcome of that case as a result of what happened there, okay? Uh, so in terms of looking at this uh, for mandatory cases, we've looked at these so far, um, uh, but these are the, the cases you need to know in terms of what is the constitutional clause it's based on. I mentioned some of those just now with Engel v. Vitale, Establishment Clause. Uh, what's the background of the case? Can you write a couple sentences on it? And then what's the outcome? Uh, and that really is important here. Now, they're going to give you another case that you're not going to be familiar with, but they're they're going to give you background on that one. They're going to give you details. And they're, what they're going to have you do is compare the two cases. So you have to know these cases so you compare them. You can compare it to the ones uh, that are out there uh, that they're going to give. And again, they're going to give you all the information on the other case. Uh, but what you're going to look at here is how does it apply to the case I need to know? And that really is the, the critical piece that we see here. I hope you found this helpful uh, in terms of the overview for this chapter. Uh, that's all for now. And I will see you in the next chapter on civil rights as well as in the top 12 highlights on civil liberties. Until next time, we will see you soon.